This is Classical Ideas with Greg Soden. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. I grew up listening to punk and hardcore in St. Louis, Missouri. One of my favorite things to do was look at people's shirts at shows and then go to Vintage Vinyl and look for those bands' CDs. It's totally different than now where I can look up anything I want on streaming services while standing in concert halls and where I can look up songs playing over the PA system in real time. But at 14, shirts at punk shows were of the utmost importance. It showed our lineage and our shirts showed part of us. One thing I clearly remember is everyone in St. Louis had judge shirts at hardcore shows. I'm particularly interested in spiritual punk rockers like Noah Levine, Brad Warner of Zero Defects, Miguel Chen from Teenage Bottle Rocket, Josh Corda of Dharma Punks, the work of Equal Vision Records, Dustin Kenzer from Thrice, and others who discuss their spiritual practices. So imagine my glee when I was reading an article online a few months ago talking about the book Matinee, All Ages on the Bowery, about New York City hardcore in the 80s. And I discovered a picture of Dr. Jimmy Yu, who was the original bassist of Death Before Dishonor and New York hardcore legends judge. I was pleased to discover that he was now a professor of Buddhist studies a Chan Buddhist monk and founder of the Tallahassee Chan Center in Florida. Guo Gu, Dr. Jimmy Yu, is the founder of the Tallahassee Chan Center, which can be seen online at www.tallahasseechan, which is C-H-A-N, dot com. And he is also the guiding teacher for the Western Dharma Teachers Training Course at the Chan Meditation Center in New York, and the Dharma Drum lineage. He is one of the late Master Sheng Yen, 1930-2009's, senior and closest disciples, and assisted him in leading intensive retreats throughout the United States, Europe, and Asia. Guo Gu has edited and translated a number of Master Sheng Yen's books from Chinese to English, and he is a professor of Buddhism and East Asian religions at Florida State University. It was a real pleasure speaking with Gogu about Chan Buddhism, New York Hardcore, and his work. If you're interested in some of his mainstream work, you can check out his writing for Lion's Roar magazine. A few pieces that I would recommend are You Are Already Enlightened and Exposing, Embracing, Responding, and Letting Go, both from Lion's Roar magazine. His book, Passing Through the Gateless Barrier, from Shambhala Press, is also quite a fantastic journey. So this is a great conversation. We talk about New York hardcore and Chinese Chan Buddhism all in one go. So without further delay, I bring you Guo Gu. Welcome to Classical Ideas. I am here today with Guogu, who is the founder of the Tallahassee Chan Center in Tallahassee, Florida. So thank you so much for coming on Classical Ideas today. Thank you for having me. I'm curious if you can just go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit to the audience and maybe talk about your lineage. Well, I wear a couple of hats. Uh, Guo Gu is my um, Buddhist Dharma lineage name. I belong to the Dharma drum lineage of Chan. Chan is the uh, precursor to Zen. Uh, so, um, in 
that capacity. Um, I am a teacher of Chan meditation in general, but uh, I also uh, teach at Florida State University as uh, uh, my uh, lay name, Jimmy Yu. Excellent. So I teach high school, so teacher to teacher here today. This is great. Um, so imagine that you were to walk into a high school classroom uh, for a Q&A session with a young generation of angsty adolescents, somewhat like you and I were with, as punk rockers growing up um, in school. And they want to know about Asian religion. And the students want to know what Asian traditions can offer them as they embark on to college and the work phase of their lives. So what do you tell them about what Asia can offer Westerners? I usually start off where my audience um, is at, you know. Um, so this is an age where they are exploring new ideas. I should say beginning to explore new ideas. What's most important to them are probably their friends, you know, and uh, along with that, uh, different music and uh, um, internet and so on. You know, I probably would pick up on what kind of t-shirts they'd be wearing mm -hmm. and kind of spin off, off of that, you know. Um, ultimately, it's about uh, knowing about the other, knowing about you know, something you know, uh, foreign to them. Uh, I probably will work off their received notions of, you know, what eight Asian religions are, Buddhism. Um, you know, something funny. Um, uh, I have a friend in New York, longtime friend. He volunteers at the Rubens Museum, which is a Tibetan uh, Buddhist museum um, in the city, and he volunteers as a tour guide. You know, so a 13-year-old. It was. It was uh, at one time it was a group of students, even younger than your students. They're about 13, 14, and um, so as a tour guide, he asked, "Does anyone know where B the Buddha, who the Buddha is?" And this 13-year-old girl uh, started riffing about, uh, you know, Siddhartha, Gautama, you know, Buddhist tradition, you know, Four Noble Truth. It was just amazing, you know. Yeah. So the young people are living a whole new world now, you know, than you and I when, when, when we, we were growing up. So aside from music, you know, kind of T-shirts that wear, they, they have access to all of this knowledge, you know. Mm -hmm. But I... I would start with where they are and point them ultimately to relationships. You know, it's about understanding the other, um, uh, understanding you know the Buddhist tr tradition and see how they respond, and uh, go off from there. And I say relationship because this is a kind of cornerstone for Buddhism specifically. You know, because um, in, even the loftiest Buddhist teaching on emptiness, you know, and no self and awakening is really about relationships. So I know that you found meditation when you were very young, when you were a kid, right? How old were you, how old were you when you first were taught meditation? Four years old. So... Did meditation click with you when you were that young? Meditation to me at that time was just fun. You know, um, I really liked the monk who taught me meditation, seated meditation. And for me at that time was just a joy to uh, see the reactions from his face when my legs were twisted up in a pretzel shape and... And um, the rapport that we had. So I had no idea what meditation was for 
or Buddhism for that matter, but you know, in that um, friendship and and uh, interaction, what was most important for me was just the fact that I had such a pleasant um, experience growing up, visiting Buddhist monasteries, and uh, doing kind of, kind of mimicking what they're doing, you know, like seated med- meditation, and um, getting positive response from them, kind of like pleasing them, you know. Sure. Um, and that kind of sowed the seeds, which later kind of blossomed. So I have a four-year-old, four-year-old daughter. And mm-hmm. she's got a lot of energy, and she's a lovely, creative little girl. Um, how can I? What would you suggest if I wanted to teach her uh, to do what the monks taught for you when you were that exact age? Like, what can I do with my four-year-old to to help her um, look inward, maybe a little? Yeah. You know, um, I would teach her that no matter what happens in the world around her, there's always something somewhere safe within that she can access to, you know, that uh, peace that's always there. And um, of course, with four-year-olds, you know, she can access it at most maybe five minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? But even five, just to let her know that there's, there's a place that she can go where she can enjoy being with herself and uh, accessing this kind of peace, that is sufficient. Now, when um, I was learning meditation and, um, you know, at one time in the monastery, we held different uh, children's program and and so on. I didn't use particularly uh, kind of Chan or Zen methods of practice. And I basically taught them to contemplate sounds, you know, to notice how many sounds there are in the environment. And I used to just take them out to the park and then to also listen to, you know, silence. So to, in, in the park, there are all kinds of sounds. So that kind of, active form of meditation works quite well you know for some kids it's this um, you know following the breath enjoying the sensation of breath and accessing this peace within uh, that also works well too yeah but short quality um, sessions as opposed to uh, long Sure, sure. I went on a uh, a silent retreat last weekend um, at the Kansas Zen Center in Lawrence, Kansas, and I found exactly what you just said to enjoy being with myself during that entire day. And so I think that that's a skill that I wish I would have learned from long ago. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, our times are changing. Mm-hmm. You know, um, a lot of schools are uh, quite progressive now. You know, um, they recommend uh, yoga. They have like yoga for little kids, and they have meditation, um, quite a quiet time mm-hmm. in public schools. Yeah, and yeah. in charter schools. So it's very different from when we were growing up. Yeah, I've That's had so some. I've had some meditation teachers come into my class and talk about paying attention to the breath and like they've done a little bit of that and the seniors who have learned how to do it in my religions class when they've left they come back and they say wow I looked at the rest of the day so much differently whenever I had that time to look inward for a little bit and just pay attention and calm down for a few minutes. Yeah. I think it's so important nowadays because uh, different than when we were growing up, you know, our, our sense of fun was, you know, go out and ride bike and hang out with friends and so on. Now, they just go into this smartphone dystopia, mm-hmm. you know, this 
constructed world of media and so on and and uh, bombarded with all kinds of um, information so so their brains are being kind of formatted in a certain way and the neuroscientists would talk about this in terms of neuroplasticity to favor uh, fragmentation over you know depth mm-hmm. short kind of synoptic information over more nuanced understanding like reading a book having yeah. the book in your hand you know so so their their um attention span it's kind of being shaped and and naturally they're kind of processing of information in the world is uh being shaped in a particular way so this practice of meditation and kind of going inside and finding that safe abode no matter what happens you always can access this um, within that is so important and you know uh, alongside of the benefit of course of developing concentration you know and uh, being in tune with one's emotions and feelings you know so, yeah. yeah so you talk a lot so you just talked a lot about like the formative years and how we can shape ourselves and there's a little tangential side path from buddhism that i want to talk to you about your life because i have to be honest i found you not through the world of buddhism but because i was Uh a fan of hardcore music when i was growing up even to today and i want to talk to you a little bit about those years because i know that you were highly involved in hardcore in new york city and also in punk rock and simultaneously Buddhism. Um, so, and it's just an area that I'm super interested in as well because I played in bands in St. Louis for years and years. Um, mm-hmm. When did you first find hardcore when you were a kid? Because I know you were he- had access to Buddhism first, and then you also found this world of hardcore punk rock in New York City. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Sure. My social environment was such that I was really outcasted, you know. When I first came to America, I was in New York, but uh, we, we moved to New York, but short period of time, and then we moved right on to New Jersey. So upper middle class or middle class. Um, and in that area, there, were, there weren't any Asian families, which is basically all white. And there was like one, you know, African-American family. That's it, you know, so... The kids then, their exposure to anyone Asian is basically like Bruce Lee. (laughs) That was their reference point. So um, outcast in a sense that, you know, I got picked on and they want to kind of test out their wrestling skills and boxing skills. So I fought a lot. I fought a lot. And uh, so by the seventh I came here when I was fifth grade. So by the seventh grade, uh, and of course my elder brother, three years older than me, were experiencing the same thing. So by the seventh grade, I was really just hanging out with my brother's friends. You know, I was in seventh grade, but they were in high school, you know, freshmen, and they are getting picked on. So we just found a niche in that small um Montville, New Jersey community of uh, punk rockers, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and um, you know, you know, we we shaved our heads and uh, dressed a certain way, and we, my first show matinee show Sunday matinee show at CBGBs was when I was thirteen years old, you know, and uh, I just found a cohort of kids like me mm-hmm. <laughs> you know uh kind of uh, marginalized uh group of frustrated angry kids <laughs> 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 and uh re-found this camaraderie and and um i have to say new york city's skinheads is, it's quite different you know it's so diverse tolerant and it's very different than what receives image of skinheads you know when you think of skinhead okay nazi white wasp this and that but new york city 
like Puerto Ricans, you know, <laughs> me being Chinese, you know, blacks, you know, you know, Italian Guidos, you know, all, they're all over the spectrum. And, and it's this mix and something uh, peculiar is <clears throat> there was always this close connection with the Harry Krishnas in New York City. You know, they offer free food. My God, it's great. You yeah. Know? <laughs> a lot of the skinheads kind of got free food there. And then they became Harry Krishna for a while, <laughs> kind of left for a while. So the Harry Krishna community in New York City, many of them were ex punk rockers. Mm -hmm. you know, they had tattoos different than Harry Krishna, say, like Midwest, you know, mm -hmm. or, or somewhere else. So they had this edgy to them so there was a close and then I just uh, went back to my own roots Buddhism instead of Hare Krishna's you mm -hmm. know so uh, you know went through that age from maybe 13 to um, um, 17 18 and then I just kind of dived into Buddhism during my college years you know Chan Zen Buddhism in particular but I do want to say something, a tag on a, a footnote about that. Sure. There's a there's a camaraderie, you know, we're kind of all marginalized, we're going to go all angry. But in the shows, in the, you know, on the dance floor and the matinees and our gatherings, we all found, we all found a sense of transcendence, you know, at the time, I probably didn't. I mean, I I didn't know what the word transcendent means, but it's it's kind of unspoken. But there's a sense of freedom, you know, when we dived off stage, when we kind of, you know, just uh, went all out and we were in bands and playing. There's a kind of uh, kind of social critique. We we're part of the society, but we we're outside of it, and. Uh, slam dancing and, and so on so so there's a real transcendence there that united us and that i i link to the kind of freedom that i found in chan zen yeah. and, and you know i've, I've uh, been in a circle pit at a sick of it all show and yeah. you are completely present in the moment Mm -hmm. There's nothing that is distracting you from being in that circle pit during sick of it all. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I completely yeah. understand what you're saying. Um, yeah. Were you doing any spiritual practice during your days in Judge and Death Before Dishonor? Um, I was still visiting my teacher. You know, I when I said I began, uh, I was exposed to meditation for, that was in Taiwan. You know, I came here when I was 11 to to the United States and uh, even went through my um, straight edge hardcore days, um, early teen. I still visited my teacher uh, that I met when I was 11, so that, that be, who later became my root teacher, you know, my, my mentor, Master Shen Yan of the Dharma Drum lineage. Of Chan. So I still visited him, you know, you know, went through the sittings. Um, it wasn't so prominent uh, until I uh, turned 18, you know, when I was a freshman in college and then I really, really dive into it. Yeah. And then by that time, I was slowly, um, slowly kind of leaving the um, straight edge hardcore scene uh, I would uh, still do recordings uh, with Judge mm -hmm. you know but I was just you know, I, I was in a different world yeah, yeah. so there's mm -hmm. there's like this trend among punk rockers like I think it names like Le Noah Levine from Dharma Punks or Brad Warner from Hardcore Zen or there's also Miguel Chen who's a contemporary guy who plays bass for Teenage Bottle Rocket but they're all involved in Buddhism and they're all involved in punk rock. What do you think it is about Buddhism that's such a, a powerful appeal to punk rockers? Is it just that camaraderie? I don't know if I can draw that conclusion. Yeah. You know, 
um, like a one-to-one -one conclusion, punk rockers, Buddhism. <laughs> you yeah. Know? I think it's just, you know, out of all the Buddhist teachers, meditators, you know, there are these small handful of people who had that experience and they're all of a certain age, you know, at a certain time. You know, so there are these other circumstantial conditions that shape their life a particular way. You know, marginalization, you know, response to the kind of music scene at that at that time, family background, you know. And they found a home in Buddhism. I'm sure if you look at New York Hare Krishna communities, you probably draw the same conclusion. So there are these other conditions. Sure, yeah. sure. So I want to transition us into uh, your lineage, Dharma Drum Mountain, Master Sheng Yen, your work and your books that I've dived into since we began connecting. So what is Dharma Drum Mountain for um, those who've never heard of it? Dharma Drum Mountain is a vision, uh, first and foremost, of bringing in a very concrete practical, engaging way, Chan or Zen Buddhist practices to um, this world, you know, contemporary time. So the uh, slogan that my teacher uh, used to say is, um, you know, Dharma Drum, it's, it's, it's um, you know, uplift the character of humanity and uh, transform this world into a pure land or Buddha land, you know, an awakened mm -hmm. place. Now, Dharma Drum Mountain is also a concrete um, place situated in uh, North uh, Taipei, Taiwan. Um, and it's also an international, so that's the headquarter, and it's also an international uh, organization of um, branches throughout the world, both uh, west and uh, in um, uh, east, uh, centering on two main things. You know, uh, and these are two main kind of characteristics of my teacher. He has these two sides to him. One is the Chan master, Zen master. Another, he had this academic side to, to him. You know, he was always um, interested in education, you know, Buddhist education, uh, multiple different levels. So, so uh, what unites these different branches uh, to the headquarter and the different programs that Dharma Drum advocate and for the society and so on is either kind of intensive retreat practices and kind of daily Chan practices or education at multiple different levels. For example, at Dharma Drum Mountain, Taiwan, there's a seminary, there's a university, there's a graduate school, and there's also education broadly construed like um, so socially engaged form of Buddhism as a kind of continuing education, you know, for adults um, and the elderly. So, so, you know, Chan and education, these two unite uh, Dharma Drum Mountain institutionally. But first and foremost, Dharma Drum is a vision of bringing Buddhism from the cloud down to people's lives. And that is uh, kind of a, an approach to Buddhist practice. I watched a video, a lecture that you gave in 2015 at Stanford in their Buddhist studies department, where you talked <clears throat> a lot about Master Sheng Yen and his approach. Um, and you described him as he placed himself outside of the Chan tradition and more in alignment with all of Chinese Buddhism. Um, I was curious if you can elaborate on what that means, because that line struck me as really interesting, and I wanted to see if you could elaborate for me. It was a crucial point in his own teaching career, kind of clerical career. Um, 
you know, he had these two sides to him. Um, interested in Buddhist monastic education and then broadly construing education as a way to bring Buddhism to the world. And he never kind of narrowly confined, pigeonholed himself to be just a Chan Zen master. You know, the received notion of Chan Zen is that, you know, you know, meditation only, not dependent on words and language, kind of direct access to awakening. You know, you don't need to, to, to kind of, um, yeah, um, engaging scriptural study. You know, so, so, so that wasn't him, you know. So when he kind of, um, when he taught Buddhism, or Chan, what he was interested in was what is the most effective method and teachings and how to make it accessible to people. So he wasn't really pitching home himself as Chan. So that's what I meant by he always stood outside of Chan. Um, even though he had these lineages going to him, you know, the two existing lineages of Chan. But um, I think there's a crucial kind of uh, shift that occurred in, in the late 90s where he had a dialogue with His Holiness the Dalai Lama in New York City, uh, where I helped to or organize that uh, event actually where he, uh, so the Dalai Lama wanted to, uh, so the, uh, the event was called Wisdom Teachings. So Dalai Lama gave uh, some teachings and the kind of crescendo was this dialogue between the Chinese tradition, Han tradition, and the Tibetan tradition um, on wisdom, right? So that kind of put him within the tradition or pigeonholed him in Chan because Chan is known as you know this you know, direct access of awakening uh, you know um, so they dialogued in that capacity and in preparation he crafted a um, kind of doctrinal Buddhist doctrinal classification chart where he harmonized all of the Buddhist teachings from the perspective of Chan. And that was a unique occasion for him to do that because he always understood Chan within the larger Chinese Buddhist tradition. But for that occasion, he tried to understand the whole Chinese Buddhist tradition from the perspective of Chan. And uh, something really clicked with him. At that time, he was also writing a commentary to this particular Chan text that did precisely that. And uh, these two e events, the commentary that he wrote, plus in preparation with the Dalai Lama, just kind of gelled. And from that point on, uh, his stance with Chan changed. You know, he started to identify himself more within the Chan tradition. You know, he could do the same thing what he has always done. You know, the most effective methods, you know, accessible for modern people. Except now, he just kind of spun it from the perspective of Chan as opposed to Chinese Buddhism. You know, and the publication that uh, he that he produced after that in the 2000s and kind of all kind of took that position of within Chan to explicate, you know, the whole of Buddhist tradition. So he seems like he had such an open minded and curious approach. He seems like he's a genuinely curious person asking lots of questions and pursuing sort of like wonder, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, 
how does his curiosity inspire you in your own practice and work and teaching? I think just through osmosis, you know, um, gradually, kind of imperceptibly, because you know I knew him when I was young, and when I became a monk, it was, it, it, you know, I had a very close relationship with him as his attendant, always with him, so he just kind of just grew on me. I think you know, it, it wasn't like hey, this is how I teach, and you should study that to be open minded, <laughs> so on and so on. You know, um, so it, it just kind of grew on me. But I will say that the sense of wonderment in Chan, the, the fundamental question of who we are and uh, what this means, it's uh, so important in the Chan Zen tradition, and you know, and of course the whole Buddhist tradition that uh, it kind of informs um, everything that, that you know, Chan Buddhist practitioners do. Mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. there's this aspect, and then there is this uh, personal history with him, just like over decades, just kind of, um, kind of grew, grew on me. So my, I would say my, um, my training with him was not a kind of formal or structured training because my schedule were very different than the rest of the monastics. You know, my schedule was with him. I just travel attended to him, so it wasn't like um, kind of formal training that the rest of the clerics, you know, uh, went through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have your book here. Here it is. Mm -hmm. Hooray. Yeah. Uh, Passing Through the Gateless you. Barrier. You're welcome. And in the introduction to your book, you mentioned that koan or gongon practice is a method to wake up our lives. And I mm -hmm. recently was given my own koan from a master in a Korean lineage, so I was really exciting. I was really excited to get one. Yeah. And it was mm -hmm. uh, amazing to receive my own to and begin to think about it. So what are some of the benefits of your own koan practice and the practice of your students Like, what have you seen your, how have you seen your students grow with their koan practice? Um, the way I teach gongans, or I'm, I'm just going to use the Japanese pronunciation because it's more popular. The way I teach koans, it's unstructured. And I don't like to confine myself to curriculum. Um of koans, a formal koan study. Um, there are strengths and weaknesses to that approach. And Chan is, has always been pretty fluid, you know, natural about this. Very often, koans are own life stories manifest in kind of moments in our life as kind of natural questioning, you know. And um, so I adapt to that with regard to uh, teaching um, my students. So, and this is an ongoing process. To frame it in terms of kind of benefit, not benefit, Probably not the not beneficial, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> yeah. you know, because um, it is precisely this um, <laughs> gaining and losing mind that kind of gets gets us entangled in our life and uh, life problems, you know. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so it's a kind of kind of multi layered exploration into my student or my own life so it it's quite alive and organic that way so uh, it's so 
that book, Passing Through the Gateless Barrier, is really um, bringing koan practice down from the clouds because it had been uh, structured and um, routinized and uh, you know made into curriculum. And so I'm trying to free up the original spirit of Chan. Koans, because because these moments and crescendos are just it's it's ha- it's a collection of stories of what happened to people in their daily lives, you know. Yeah. So it's quite alive that way. I, I was reading this last night, and this book is really something that I'm like taking my time with. I'm really taking some time to digest it. And you have a quote in here that I wanted to read really quick, and then I want to get your thoughts on this because I feel like this. It seems like your practice to me might be found in this one spot. I see the thread of genuineness and sincerity coming out a lot in the text. And the quote is on page 63, and it says, You must be earnest, unpretentious, whether you are in retreat practice or in daily life, working, sweeping the floor, or relating to people. Your practice must be fueled by a sincere, down-to-earth desire of wanting to know who you are. Yeah. Is that what yeah. practice is all about to you? Um, it's one aspect of it, and it's an important ingredient. And it is that which cuts through the curriculum, the structured, and the external form of Chan Zen practice. You know, to always um, bear in mind the our original intention uh, why we embark on this practice and uh, what this moment uh, is so um, alongside that since sincerity and earnestness I would add um, humility you know uh, not know everything accomplish gaining things, but the sense of wonderment, the sense of not knowing, um, that openness. So that's the beginning. It's not what Chan is all about, but it's a, it's the beginning of it. So one criteria. So I'm curious if you can offer some suggestions on anything you think that people should read. Um, if, you, if people want to know more about Chan, uh, what would you suggest that they look at? And you can suggest anything you like. You know, Buddhist publication in the English language is, has been dominated by, you know, Zen, and then Tibetan Buddhism, and then uh, mindfulness movement. You know, this. I wouldn't even call it the South Asian Buddhist tradition because it has taken on a life of its own, you know, this mindfulness movement, Vipassana, insight, whatever you call it. So Chan, there's there's not that many books out there, you know. um, There are works by my teacher and uh, works that kind of um, resonate more with... um, the Chan tradition, kind of the fluidity and the openness of Chan, would be um, Thich Nhat Hanh's books, mm-hmm. and um, there's also a lineage of uh, Master Xuanhua, the City of Ten Thousand Buddhas. You know, he passed away, and um, some of his works, um, and then there are authors, you know. So I, I kind of draw a distinction between a commentary work or just works by Chan teachers. And then there are authors who are thinkers mm-hmm. who, who write very well, able to articulate, kind of repackage, you know, Chan, Zen, or Buddhism um, in a certain way. But, um, and they certainly have their experiences but they may not belong to a particular lineage you know so they're just kind of um, um, thinkers mm-hmm. 
you know, and, uh, practitioner. So, so there are some books like that, and uh, some of them, some of these thinkers are translators. You know, like uh, Red Pine. And, you know, he ha- he has his own take on Chan Buddhism and the different classical texts that were very important in Chan. He he translated them. So his his works. You know, so they're not not too many out there. It's not like a whole list I can give you. You know. Yeah. 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 But uh, I would say the safe bet is just to um, you know start with the authors that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Well, Guogu, this has been a really, really great conversation for me, and I have a lot of things to take away from this and um, you know, digest for myself and do a little further exploration. But I have one last question, and mm-hmm. it's about punk rock. Sure. There is an LP by the band Judge called Chung King, mm-hmm. and it is the most expensive record I think that's ever sold on eBay. Do really? You- I, I didn't know how much it cost. A lot. So, do you have a copy of Chung King on vinyl? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, bummer. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, I I left. I became a monk when that LP came out. I recorded it with them. Yeah. And then I uh, just went into monasticism. You know, I can probably get one from Mike Judge. You know, if. Um, if I if I ever saw him, you know, or or John Porcelli. Um but uh, you know, John for a while was was living um, Gainesville, Florida, not 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 too far from me. But he moved back up north, so I haven't found myself back up there yet. But, uh, yeah. Well, I want to thank you for doing the book matinee, All Ages on the Bowery, because that's how I discovered you. Mm. And I'm loving your book, Passing Through the Gateless Barrier, which came out through, um, uh, what, what year was it last year, 2016? Um, 2016, Shambhala. Shambhala yeah. Press. And yeah, so I am enjoying it. And I think that readers who are interested in Buddhism would enjoy it as well. I've already suggested it to a couple friends. And I want to thank you for your time today. And thank you so much. Thank you for coming on Classical Ideas. It's been a pleasure. Same here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is performed and composed by Derek Striving. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you would like to support this show, please subscribe or leaving a rating in iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.